Hey everyone, host of Shelves, Jeremy Meyer here. If you like the podcast, I thought I'd recommend a couple others for you. If you want to hear more about unproduced scripts, check out Screenplay Archaeology. If you want to hear some other movie or entertainment related discussion, check out the Entertainment Buffet podcast. If you're interested in some video game discussion, check out my friends over at the Darkcast and Darkstation.com. Also be sure to visit some of our friends of the show, the Nerds and Marks podcast and 616 Entertainment. Thank you and enjoy the show. Oh man, hello. Is uh, this thing on? Whew. I think it's been a while since I've actually talked into one of these, but uh, welcome to the Shelved Podcast. I am your host, Jeremy Meyer, and uh, today I have a very special episode. I know it's been a little while since I've posted an episode, but I thought I'd come back with a fun one. Uh, we have another interview today, which uh, is with uh, Michael Manissari, who uh, was introduced to me through my friend Jeff, who's been on the show. And uh, Michael has a movie that just premiered at Sundance called Give Me Liberty. So I had him on the show to talk about the movie. We also dive into his career and uh, kind of working as a producer and as an actor. Um, he uh, most notably might be known for his acting roles on being the one of the leads on the Weird Science TV show, which uh, based on the popular 80s movie, and um, I definitely recall seeing episodes of the show as a kid. Um but yeah, so, you know, we kind of talk about his career, which, um, you know, one of these stories of just having really supportive parents can get you a long way. Um, and yeah, he was really fun to talk to. Super nice guy. Uh, it was a really fun interview. And, um, you know, I hope to have him on the show again someday in the future. It was a really easy, fun interview. And uh, I feel like I learned a lot. It's one of my favorite things about getting these interviews is, you know, I've had different people from all different aspects of filmmaking in the show. Um, you know, a writer, a producer now, a actor, director. Uh, it's really fun for me to kind of, you know, dive into these different aspects of filmmaking, hopefully in a way that, you know, you don't often hear in interviews. Um, you know, is you know, we could sit here and talk about his movie and we did, and it sounds like a really great movie and whenever it becomes available to watch, you should definitely check it out. I know I am going to. It sounds really fun, really interesting. Um, but yeah, you know, just hearing a more a business side of the movie industry, um, he's he has a really great outlook on an industry that can often be pretty nihilistic. So uh, it was really fun to talk to Michael. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy this interview uh, and be sure to, you know, rate the show on iTunes. Give us five stars. Uh, check out that Patreon, patreon.com slash shelved. Um, uh, the YouTube and or not the YouTube. Well, yeah, the YouTube. Check out the YouTube as well. Shelf Podcast, uh, Twitter and Instagram at Shelf Podcast. Be sure to follow us there so you're not missing anything. And I just want to apologize. It's it's been a long time since I've posted an episode. I've kind of just been in a rut creatively and um, kind of going through some stuff personally that I you know didn't want to bring onto the show with me, but. Um, I have, you know, this interview, I have an episode coming out for a script. I have a, uh, some stuff planned that I don't want to give away yet that hopefully I'll be snatching this weekend for uh, the next couple weeks shows. So, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully I'm back in the full swing of things and it actually feels good to be doing this again. So just wanted to apologize for all the, you know, missed content, but hopefully you enjoy this episode and the many more to come in the near future. So Sit back and listen to my interview with uh, Michael Manasseri. Um, but all right, I, I just want to thank you for sitting down to do this with me. Uh, I always, sure. you know, appreciate people who are willing to take the time out and do something they don't have to do. So I always like to start off with a little thank you. Ah, you're welcome. Um, but uh, yeah, so why don't you uh, tell me a little bit about yourself? Um, you know, I see, you know, actor on your IMDb, I see like actor, director, producer, um, you know, seems like you got your hands on a lot of pots here. So how did you uh, kind of get into this whole situation? Um, well, 
in the uh, in the very beginning in ancient history, um, <laughs> I uh, I used to be a child actor when I was younger, oh. and I was fortunate enough to have worked on Broadway and off Broadway and doing a lot of singing and dancing and singing for my supper and uh, things like that in New York. I was raised in Maryland and then New York City. Um, my parents. Uh, were not stage parents. They were not in the industry at all. Actually, it was just my uh, my older sisters and my younger brother. We all just kind of gravitated towards school plays and musicals. Okay. And in that process, one day my dad saw an ad in the Washington Post for auditions for uh, Evita when the musical Evita was like a really huge deal in the world. And uh, he had just asked, "Hey, do you guys want to go check this thing out?" You know, I don't know anything about it. And my brother and I ended up checking it out. And my brother actually ended up getting that job as, uh, you know, as a child in this really big show at the National Theater in Washington. And yeah. Um, and anyway, that was just even more intriguing because, uh, you know, as a kid, he was also making a small fortune. And uh, and, our, you know, our siblings, we were all like, hey, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, one thing led to another. And, um, you know, some local manager uh, saw some of the stuff that we had done and uh, asked our parents if uh, if we'd be interested in seeing if she wanted to help us out and we uh, that kind of followed up with trips to New York City to audition for things and anyway we were uh, we were fortunate kids you know we kind of kind of looked like we knew what we were doing and we just started working a lot and uh, then you know after high school in New York City. Um, I was kind of the only one who continued in the business and uh, and went out to L.A. and uh, made some, you know, was fortunate enough to be in some movies. Um, and in the 90s, I was in a TV series called Weird Science that was based on the movie from the 80s. Which was a, a great movie, and I definitely recall seeing episodes of the series, like, growing up. Yeah, yeah. It was on the USA Network, and at the time, this was when, I mean, cable still wasn't, cable was nowhere near what cable is today. So uh, I actually think this is one of USA's first original programs. Um, they were doing stuff like uh, World w Wrestling Federation kind of stuff up yeah. to now. So, they um, still are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, hey, I guess if it's making you money, you keep doing it. Yeah. Um, but that was a phenomenal experience for me just because it was a one-camera film show. We did uh, four seasons, 88 episodes, got to work with all kinds of different directors and producers, and um and really that was my film school in yeah. terms of uh just basically um having these wonderful on-set experiences we shot at universal studios and um you know i remember talking with one of our regular directors one day and he actually said to me you know michael you could do this you really could do this and i was like wait a second <laughs> maybe he's right <laughs> um and then soon after when that show ended um, I mean, it actually, in, in a crazy way, it never really ended. It, you could actually still find it. I think it plays on Hulu now, and it played all over the oh, world. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it played everywhere. So that was, again, fortunate for me as a young man um, who was just able to make, you know, a very decent living doing something that he loved. And then I transitioned to uh, basically directing, producing, writing soon after that. And, and, you know, kind of had to start at the beginning because nobody really knew me as a writer-director or producer and uh you know worked my ass off started writing a couple things got optioned and then over time with some you know with some actually some other actors who uh wanted to be producers and directors we just kind of formed a a little group and uh started to get some things off the ground and uh you know that led to one movie going to sundance other movies going to different places around the world learning about distribution of independent movies how that really really works and then as time went on and we started getting into the whole digital age um just you know kind of went with the flow in terms of getting involved in all kinds of productions um that have that have been on different platforms played on different in different festivals and things all over the place so um and that's how i eventually um got involved with give me liberty i uh, i'm now based in detroit i've been in detroit eh, almost a decade now uh and that's from uh, my my most of my immediate family kind of gravitating toward the area in southeast Michigan. Um, I I miss my parents a lot. Wanted to see them more, 
And um, a little while ago, uh, Michigan had come up with a film incentive, and uh, which ended up being a really powerful film incentive in the industry for a while. So I thought, okay, I could uh, I could see my family more, and uh, and keep making these little movies, and I could do it in Michigan, I could do it in Detroit, and in 2015 that incentive disappeared because uh, these incentives all over the place, as you probably know, yeah, political, you know, they're they're political footballs. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's aware of like Marvel in Atlanta and stuff like that. And sure, exactly, exactly. So you know, Georgia's still popping, Louisiana's popping, Ohio is is really in the business now, and um, it's just a reality of making film or television or whatever you want to call. You know, I still call it television, even if it's on Netflix and yeah. Amazon and all those things. We're we're making episodics, um, and just in this day and age. You know, look, the origination points for almost everything still is centered in Hollywood and New York City uh, in terms of the in terms of the creatives. Unless you're Tyler Perry, there's not a lot of <laughs> stuff that's actually being originated in Atlanta. Um, so those are still hubs for the industry. But as you, again, know and have seen or witnessed, people are making things all over the world in terms of the actual producing. So that that was what enabled me to actually come to Detroit, get involved here uh, establish a foundation with my production company. And like I said, you know, I could, I was able to like, Hey, call my dad up and say, Hey, you want to play golf or call my mom up and say, Hey, you want to, you want to go get some dinner? Um, which was really important to me. Yeah. Um, uh, but then once that incentive kind of kicked the bucket, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of my crew, a lot of my partners, uh, and rightly so ended up gravitating to Atlanta or finally going back out to LA or New York and what I've been doing in the process these last few years, I attempt to bring as much as I can to Detroit because I still believe that, you know, this renaissance, this cultural renaissance that has been happening in Detroit is really important. And I want the world to know about it. And so when I can, I still bring productions here to Detroit. And at the same time, just because of the economic reality, when I got to scoot and bop around in different places around the country, or around the world for work, that's what I do. Uh, and that's when one of my Detroit-based partners, Eddie Rubin, he actually brought me Give, or Liber Give Me Liberty. The script crossed his desk while he was working on a project in New York about a year and a half ago. I read that script um, actually around Christmas time, December 2017, so not long ago. And when I read that script, um, I just – I'd never read anything like this particular project uh, it fascinated me. I thought it was a, a beautiful project. And I just thought that if I was going to be involved and if we could, if we were lucky enough to capture what was on the page uh, in terms of actually filming and producing it, we'd have something special. And, uh, and the film ended up in Sundance. So I think we actually uh, accomplished what we set out to do. Yeah, I, I mean, it sounds great. It sounds like an interesting film. So was that shot in the Detroit area then? Nope, nope. We were um, we were trying to set it up with our um, with some of our investor uh, contacts here in Detroit. But that film was was set in Milwaukee. The writer director Carol Mikanowski and his writing partner and his producing partner Alice Austin they are based in Milwaukee. And this story, um, it's not completely autobiographical in terms of Kirill, um, but part of it is. And one of his first jobs, so he's, a, he's Russian-American. His family came to the country when he was 14, and they settled in Milwaukee, where I didn't even know, at the, I didn't know until I read this script that there is a uh, strong uh, Russian contingency in Milwaukee. Oh, I didn't know that either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so... Um, when he was in his early 20s, one of one of his first jobs was as a medical transport driver. So he would uh, drive this medical transport van in lower income areas in Milwaukee where he would pick up adults with disabilities. And he would bring them to this, uh, this place in Milwaukee called the Eisenhower Center, which is a center for disabled adults where they actually have – real jobs. They have contracts with different companies around the country um, that allow these very special individuals to to have jobs and a sense of purpose 
and uh, it's just a really wonderful, beautiful uh, organization. And and so in the movie, it's a character in his twenties who drives a medical transport van, and on this one day in the winter in Milwaukee, he uh, you know, and he starts before the sun even comes up. Mm -hmm. And he's going around picking up different individuals that we get to know in the film. And what we don't see for the longest time is there's uh, there's a there's a race. There's a racial riot slash protest that is going on in a certain section of the city. And so because of that, he cannot it's taking him forever. He's running into these, you know, literal and figurative roadblocks in the movie. Yeah. And, and he cannot get these people to where they need to be. And what also happens is. Uh, that character is also of uh, Russian descent, and he's taking care of his Russian grandfather, who's in his 80s. And the Ru and the grandfather's girlfriend has recently passed away, and the grandfather is part of a Russian choir. And the choir needs to get to the funeral, where they want to perform and basically, you know, uh, just honor the life of this woman. And all of these people in this choir who do not speak English, they also end up in this van because they have, they have no other way of getting to the funeral. So we, so we have disabled adults. We have people of different cultures, people of different races who would never otherwise be together except for this one day in this van. Um, and they have to deal with each other. And there's just this, um, this grace and beauty and frustration and, <laughs> you know, a, a confrontation in a way of everybody's own, um, beliefs and stereotypes etc uh on how they they basically uh deal with each other on this very special day and uh and i do think that we've made a a, a a beautiful a beautiful movie from a beautiful script uh and it's definitely uh in its own way it's starting to have an impact on people so we'll see what happens when it actually you know is released to the world yeah, uh, it's it sounds like a fascinating movie. It just sounds like so much going on. Yeah. Um, are are so are are the riots in the movie kind of based on any actual thing that happened, or just kind of like I mean, hate to say, ripped from the headlines of our times type situation? It's that. It's that. It's a compil you know compilation of events that have been going on obviously throughout the country, and also you know in Milwaukee. Another thing that I learned. I mean, listen, I spent a lot of time in Detroit, and you would think that with the um, what's been happening here uh, with the good and the bad and the racial makeup of the city, um, you would think that uh, Detroit is one of the most segregated cities in the country, but apparently it's Milwaukee. Oh, um, really? Yeah. So again, for me, that's also another thing for me as a producer that has been a fascinating experience. You know, I want to... I do all kinds of things, okay? I do things to pay the bills, so I do commercials, I do music videos and corporate things. Yeah. But every few years, I'm lucky enough to be involved in a movie. And part of making these movies in the independent space, um, you know, for me, as a reasoning or uh, a justification on why I want to do this, because I'm really not doing this to make a fortune, because that would be silly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's not the case in this independent film world. I mean, you can do well, you can make a living. And fortunately I've been able to be a part of some films that have been able to do that. Yeah. Um, but really for me, it's also about, about learning and experiencing. And that's, you know, part of the journey is realizing that while you're on the journey, you're lucky enough to learn about, to learn more about life, to learn more about people that you, whose paths you will, you don't cross in your normal day to day experience of being on this planet. Yeah, so, and I imagine in indie film, you know, it's obviously harder to get a movie made, but when you're actually fortunate enough to be able to get one off the ground, you probably have a lot more control over the story you get to tell. That Yes, that's part of it. And for me as a participant, because I also understand that, it's, that I'm a participant in this process. I'm a collaborator. I am somebody, you know, you, you don't get these things made without a deep, deep uh, teamwork, collaboration, you know, a uh, cooperative group of individuals to make it happen. So in that process, not only learning about the story and learning about, you know, we're meeting with different crew members or different actors, or in the case in this film, mostly non-actors, 
and oh, their really? world and their lives. Uh, there are only two experienced actors in this entire production, and they both happen to be from Russia. Everyone else is, you know, a real life human being who has never acted on screen before. And that's really uh, interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. And again, another another reason why I, you know, I jumped in because I wanted to to be a part of that experience and see if we could actually pull it off. And fortunately, the director uh, who had another project that he made a few years ago, um, he shot a similar type of, you know, a narrative feature with non-actors in a fishing village in Brazil. <laughs> oh wow! And and that movie, all, that movie actually was was a can, and uh, and 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 got a lot of attention um, for the director's ability to actually work with non-actors and create a narrative that that made sense, that was emotional, that that had an impact and a response. And so that so all of this was uh, intriguing to me. And and then going back to you know part of the jumping off point of the uh, of of a little bit of this a while ago you know going to milwaukee learning more about that city learning about the you know the changes occurring in that city and you know not only um not only learning about the you know these the redlining of districts in the past that's been done you know uh yeah. throughout our country um but 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 really because of this film diving into and being part of communities um, that I haven't before in a city I had not visited before. Um, all of that was uh, just, you know, I'm probably overusing the word fascinated, but that's what it was. It was, um, you know, and, and for me, I've never been a part of a, of a film like this before, you know, so many real people, um, a story that uh, that is this meaningful, um, you know, that I I actually realized while we were making the movie that I better pay attention to these day to day moments because it's making me a better human being, and I'm learning even more about this this craft and this business that I truly love. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the movie did really well at Sundance. I mean, are there any future plans? Or are you still kind of like seeing what else you can do with the film, where else you can bring it? Um, well, yeah, we got, uh, I mean, we got some really wonderful reviews. Um, New York Times, Hollywood Reporter, you know, almost every publication. Uh, so that was really gratifying. And we're in the process right now of exploring different options on on how we're actually going to release the film um, for for wider audiences, obviously beyond festivals. We're um, we're also waiting on a couple other uh, um, festivals that we want to get into, that we're hoping to get into before we actually uh, re release the film to the general public. Yeah, um, you, something I've always kind of been curious, and I don't know if you really have a lot to say on the topic, but you mentioned like learning about distribution. And I feel like that's something just like a lot of people maybe don't really know about. But uh, I mean, do you have any thing you can say about like just like learning about that process and like what it's well, like for an indie movie? It's you know, I mean, it's it, it's 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 tough. And it's when I say that, I mean, it's it's tough to even crack the understanding of how it really, really works. And for independent filmmakers, especially uh, newer independent filmmakers, because I was like this when I first started out. I had no idea. I, I, and things changed dramatically between, you know, making an independent film and going to festivals or going to different film markets and getting buyers from different territories to look at the film and consider it and take it out. And back in the beginning, the beginning of my producing work, it was like, you know, DVDs were still kind of a happening thing but starting to decline yeah and digital wasn't even a player yet nobody knew what to do with digital and then in the and then while while i've actually been in the midst of my independent film career you know then obviously netflix and amazon and all these things started taking flight so you know so and, and even in that arena i'm still discovering and learning about about how do you um 
you know, how do you a not uh, how do you navigate all those waters? So, yeah. And it and it is a uh, it is a system still where you're trying to as a producer or a filmmaker, you know, that's that's really not what you think about when you go in. And but now I think people are more aware that they have to think about it. And they, you know, if they can try to devise a plan on what they're trying to do. So just so just so that during the process, you can you can actually formulate different options and ideas. And 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 then it's still it's still going to be difficult, you know, unless you're able to go to the table and try to get a deal up front. And of course, that's what every independent production would love to do. But the reality yeah. is that's not what happens. <laughs> so, you know, first and foremost, like always, story, 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 story matters um that you know that script that story is going to be interesting or entertaining or educational or impactful enough to uh you know to break in to have distributors take a real look at it um and then after that of course everything else comes into play you know the casting the direction all that stuff this is just the normal things um but it's one of those things where you until you've done enough of these, you're part of it's a mystery. Um, and you just have to see how your movie, I, you know, guides you into, into that realm. And that's really where you learn. There's no, I mean, you can learn about stuff online. You can keep reading filmmaker magazine. You all the, all the information is out there about, um, you know, how can you go about getting your film distributed? I mean, there are tons of articles, et cetera, but until you actually have a movie, you have a product and you can figure out how that product is going to be accepted by the marketplace. You really have no idea what you have to go through. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it does. It's, it's a part of the business. I just, I don't hear a lot about, and that's one of my favorite things about this podcast. I get to talk to people who have dealt with, with all different areas. And I'm always just so curious. Um, and you know, I, you know, I hear the stories of like, Oh, you know, like somebody made a movie, took it to Sundance, you know, or whatever. And they get a buyer, you know, and that's kind of one of the only ways I hear, or, you know, you pitch a movie to a studio and things like that. But it's, it's interesting to hear it from the point of like somebody making indie, indie movies. Right. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, you still, it's so yes, you still have the, and that's the dream. The dream is you get into Sundance your movie, you know, gets a buzz going, there's an impact, and then you're lucky enough to get some offers. Uh, so, yes, that's still the dream. Fortunately, I've, I've actually been a part of that, uh, which is amazing in itself. Um, and at the same time, I've also been a part of projects where that doesn't happen. And you still made a really good movie, um, but, it's, it's, but it's more of an uphill battle. Yeah, in, and in, it's all about getting you, it as in front of as many people as you can. Correct, correct. And 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 through that process, you also the, the a really important thing. And this isn't any business, but it's especially true in this independent business when it comes to distribution. If you can find straight shooters, if you can really sit down with people who aren't gonna you know, basically feed you a line of bullshit about your film. Um, because sometimes you realize, or you, you come to a realization, unfortunately, where you make a movie, you do all this work, you spend all of this money. And every now and then in that distribution space, you get to a point where it looks like, Oh, wait a minute. There are people out there who actually think we made this movie so they can make money. But there's no way in hell that we're going to make any money. Yeah. <laughs> because they sit there and they go, well, we've worked really hard at cracking this system. We've worked really hard at, at putting movies out into the world. So no matter what, we're going to get paid. And we're going to get paid before you guys that made the movie and invested the movie in the movie get paid. Yeah. And because there are real gatekeepers. And, and you know, on, on some projects – especially when I was much younger and very naive, um, which I think every filmmaker starting out is naive in this process, you get, it's very easy to get screwed over. 
And that's how you learn and become uh, much more distrustful <laughs> of that space. And But I've also been fortunate enough to have met some real straight shooters, some people who are involved who, um, you know, even if on different projects, even if we did not go with them with the film uh, for whatever reasons, because there, you know, there are six or seven people making the decision. And even if I wanted to go with somebody, you know, usually it comes down to a group decision, et cetera, yeah. on what you're going to do. But I've kept track at times of different people where over the years, you know, they right up front were going to say, this is what's going to happen with your film. And every now and then I've run into some people where even if we didn't go with them, I, I, in the back of my head, I go, wow that person was right on the money. They yeah. knew this is exactly what, what transpired. And, and, and anyway, and I've actually gone back to those people at times and said, Hey, you know what? I want to work with you because, you know, there are so many other people out there who just run a crazy line of BS on filmmakers. And there are a few straight shooters out there um, that I respect and admire. Yeah, it kind of sounds like truth and honesty here is kind of maybe the most valuable currency. Yeah, for me. Now, listen, that's that's for me. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, obviously, everybody's going to kind of do their own thing, and you know, right. people are right. more willing to stoop to other levels than others. Um, I, I kind of want to talk. You know, you talk about being based out of Detroit, and um, uh, my friend Jeff, who kind of set this up together with us, you know, he's based out of Texas, mm -hmm. and you know, his group of guys, and everybody thinks of Hollywood or um, you know, movies as Hollywood in California. So, how 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 was that for you being in Detroit and having to bounce back and forth and? Like, what do you see? I mean, you know, you were talking about, you know, they had the tax incentives that's not there anymore. Um, like, do you see it still being as like a thriving film community? And is is that something that maybe the film industry is going to kind of become is just different bases around the world or the country? I think eventually it can. Um, you know, we're still the reality is we are still very much dependent in the industry on incentives just because it's so difficult to make independent films that you, you, you know, if you're going to investors and they're going to take a big giant risk, you need to mitigate the risk. And part of that risk mitigation is if you can go to a place where they can save money or they have a shot at making some money back, even without, um, because if they're going to help provide jobs in a certain community and that community is then going to give an incentive because of that, because they want people to work, then, you know, you can't, to fight against that, it's an it's an uphill battle. Um, I think, you know, as I've already mentioned, being somebody who was in Detroit and witnessing, you know, 10 years ago, all you heard about was Detroit, about Detroit was, oh, man, it's a shithole. It's falling apart. It's been falling apart for 35 years. <laughs> it's a ghost town. And being here 10 years ago, you could walk down into downtown Detroit on a two, a two o'clock on a Wednesday and maybe you would see 50 people and you would sit there and go, holy shit, this is crazy. As a filmmaker, you're going, holy shit, this is an amazing backlot because I can shoot anything here. <laughs> um, but, you know, in the last five years, and I'm being Detroit specific, um, things have changed dramatically. So the investment in downtown and midtown, the amount of businesses, the amount of jobs in the tech industry and other industries has um, – you know, part of this city is on fire in terms of what's going on and culturally and artists moving to the area. So there's been a dramatic shift. Um, there are still large pockets of Detroit that are industrial wastelands. The, you know, the money that has been invested, um, anyone would say, even those who have invested the money, that it is not spread out to all those other areas yet. But on the one look, there's there's truth on both sides. Somebody has to spend the money for the money to reach the people. And at the same time, if you are in those areas where the money hasn't reached it yet, you can certainly look at it and go, well, hey, they're just they're just trying to fix downtown and midtown and they don't care about everybody else. There's there's a truth to both sides of it. Um, and I've seen both sides of it. And and there is a lot of excitement about what's going on here. And this is back to your point, back to your question. 
Do I think that Detroit could eventually become a hub for independent film and television and digital media? Absolutely. Um, and I and I'm and that's one of the things I'm working on. I'm working on uh, with other people who are involved here, who are still here in the industry, to um, to make that happen. And at the same time, uh, until it happens, I'm very realistic about being somebody who has to. If I love my business and what I do in my business, I go where my business takes me. So I go to Milwaukee to make a movie that I really care about. I go back to Los Angeles frequently to uh, to have creative meetings all the time for projects that could film in Detroit, for projects that could film in Los Angeles or Atlanta or anyone or anywhere else in the country or the world. Yeah. And, and hearing you you know say things like that and some of the other people i've talked to on the show one of my favorite things about people in film that i've talked to is the love and desire to bring work to places that can benefit from it or you know to mm -hmm. people that can benefit from it and I, I love hearing people using their position in that way so i mean i i, I want to say thank you for doing stuff like that you're welcome. <laughs> you know, even though I'm not based in Detroit or anything, like, you know, knowing that other people are benefiting from that, that's always, like, really good to hear. Because I feel like people can hear too often just, like, how jaded the industry can be. So I always love spreading those positive stories. Yeah. And that's also, you know, the reason why or one of the reasons why incentives, film incentives can become political footballs is because, you know, uh, some part of the population in different states, um, you know, depending on what your political leanings are, etc., they do use that mantra of why are we giving money to Hollywood producers? You know, why are we giving money to jaded Hollywood to come yeah. in here and, and, you know, like use up all of our money, etc.? But at the same time, and especially in the independent film space, you know, you... For example, before there was a film incentive in Michigan that started about 10 years ago, there had been maybe $2 million worth of independent film production activity in the state of Michigan. Within five years of that incentive, it was close to $400 million wow. a year of production in the state of Michigan. The truth of the matter at the time was no one in film – for the most part, or at least in successful uh, economic engine drivers from film were coming to the state of Michigan to make movies. So the state realized if we want to draw attention to the state, draw attention to Detroit, even eventually draw tourist dollars, how can we highlight our state? But also how can we give you know, a lot of times it's because of the brain drain, because of young creative people who are going to universities within different states that, you know, they go to school and the second they graduate, they're out. They leave the state. They're going to the coasts because that's where the creative community is based. But if you can change the economic incentives and if you can create something where those young creatives, those young people in a state like Michigan can make a decision of, oh, wait a minute, they're doing creative stuff here. They're, you know, they're making movies, they're making TV shows, they're doing these things, and there are industries around that. It's not just the directors and producers and the actors and the writers and the crew people. It's all the other services that, you know, the, these, these creative projects use within the restaurants for catering, the dry cleaners, the all the other services that eventually, um, for example, we're in Michigan. There are services, there are original equipment suppliers for the auto industry. Now, of course, the auto industry is massive worldwide, etc. But you have all these other industries that build up around that, that real people in the real world are a part of. So that's the other thing that if you give it long enough in these incentives, you're creating those other services, those other service industries that are happening in Georgia, are happening in Louisiana, are happening in Ohio, and had the chance to happen in Michigan before the incentive, unfortunately, got dismantled. Um, and, and that's also where, through this process, as an independent filmmaker, 
you know, you want to, you want to help your community. You want to, uh, if you believe in your community and if you're proud of your community and if you want to, to bring, you know, these, these economic engines to your community to help the people that are in and around your community, you know, this is what you want to do. And as an independent filmmaker, these are also most likely the stories you want to tell. So that's why you also embed your own community within these stories to bring attention to things. Yeah, I I have this story in my head, like when it comes to incentives about like how it can affect a movie. And I remember when Jordan Peele was making Get Out that they were originally going to shoot the movie. I want to say somewhere in like like Washington or Oregon or something like that. And mm-hmm. like he was, you know, gung ho, ready to do the movie. And I want to say it was only like like a couple months or weeks before they shot all of a sudden it was like oh they weren't going to get the tax incentive anymore and they had to move somewhere else and then that makes sense i mean it's i i don't know the the history of it but i would not be surprised if that was the case yeah and just you know and like the way it worked out for him is like you know he he thinks that actually like made the movie better and i you know when i think of that movie in particular like in the locations they shot in i think it's totally perfect so um it, it's fascinating to hear about you know this whole incentive business, you know, I think people are aware of it, um, but it's, it's crazy to hear how political it can actually get. Yep. Especially when it's in regions of the country where uh, they haven't really been exposed to filmmaking. Yeah. Uh, And again, back to what you had said, there's, it's really easy to, uh, to basically not understand how it might help the independent filmmakers the local filmmakers, the local creative people that you want to retain in your community, it's very easy to just say, oh, jaded Hollywood, what are we doing? Yeah. And, and listen, as a business person, as a, as a person who owns a production company in a state like this that is not in California or that's not in New York City, I can also see the other side. I get it. I get what, you know what people in communities that are not used to this um, or basically they're looking at other industries uh, that to them make much more sense. So I get it. I understand it. This just happens to be the business that I'm in. Yeah. And, and I do also understand that media and stories, I mean, this is the way, we tell our stories in the world now and those stories have global impact and that global impact can also affect your community and, you know, bring attention to, uh, you know, not only just to the place because we're again, back to Michigan and Detroit. The only thing I thought about Michigan before I moved here and I thought about Detroit was everything that you had mostly seen, which was economic blight yeah and you know and then when i made the decision to come here and be part of this incentive and also be with my family and then realize wait a minute this 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 state is beautiful i mean there are things about the detroit and the architecture and the and and also the people that <laughs> that are beautiful these are like hard working midwest ethical human beings that i love getting to know and and being a part of this community. And then when you talk about the surrounding state of Michigan and, you know, especially for three seasons out of the year, I'm not a big fan of winter here. Oh, tell me, um, I live in Chicago. I can talk all yeah. about that. Yeah. So for three seasons out of the year, this place is amazing just in terms of, you know, the, the, the water, the lakes, you know, how green the forests, the parks, the it's, it's a gorgeous part of the country that if you could spot like that through film and TV and media, you know, how much more you can actually expose these beautiful parts of the country that that the world doesn't know about. The world hasn't yet discovered. Yeah, I, I, I am just sad to learn they don't really have a RoboCop. So that was a little uh, disappointing. Uh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, but uh yeah, um, I mean, is there is there anything else you want to say about the movie before um, I can let you wrap up here? Uh, I mean, I, I've just been, 
I'm really uh, grateful that I uh, that this movie, Give Me Liberty, crossed my desk. That the script through, I mean, every you know, most people in independent films say, and maybe people in the world know this, um, it's a miracle that a movie ever gets made. There, it's a phrase I've heard uttered many times in the film industry. <laughs> yes, there are so many uphill battles. Um, from you know, finding the money, putting the crew together, getting the right actors, getting the, there's just so many variables because you're dealing with human beings in a cooperative uh, environment that are trying to bring this vision to life, and um, and day to day, especially on these smaller projects, I mean, there's always an emergency, there's always a crisis, and in producing a movie, part of the job is a big part of the job is you can manage those those crises in real time when they come up um, in order to get the movie made. And that happens, you know, and on this film, th that happened almost hourly just because of all the odds <laughs> we were up against in trying to make this beautiful little movie. Um, and, uh, but for me, um, it's been well worth it. I'm thrilled that I got to be a part of it, and uh, I'm looking forward to Give Me Liberty um, again coming out uh, into the world and, uh, you know, and hopefully um, a lot of people will see it and appreciate it for just the, uh, the wonderful project that it is. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy to think of the amount of time and work that goes into making two hours of video, you know? And yeah. I, I just don't think people realize how crazy it can actually be. Indeed. Um, all right. Well, I, I want to thank you again and congratulate you on your movie and thank you. you know the success that it's it's getting so far and hopefully to further success. Thank you very much. And uh, this is this has been a great chat and I feel like I learned a lot and I hope everybody listening also learned a lot. All right. Awesome. I hope uh, that's one of my goals every day is to learn a lot. So uh, <laughs> yeah. hopefully I was able to spread some wisdom. Uh, yeah, uh, I, you know, I really appreciate you coming on and, you know, if you ever need to come on again, you know, the movie's going to come out on a, a, a Blu-ray of some sort, you know, you need to let people know, just let me know. I shall, I shall do that. Thanks, man. All right. Well, thanks for chatting with me. All right. Take care. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.